Palmer with Catholic Community Health, and thank you for being here for Dr. Osborne's presentation, Understanding Hoarding Disorder. Um, we also really appreciate you being here in a punctual manner where it's very respectful to our speaker's time. Before we get started, there are a few housekeeping items we do need to go over. First, this program is for information only and not intended to be a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the help of your medical provider for health concerns. Second, this program will be recorded. By having your webcam on or coming off mute, you are consenting to being recorded. To ensure that the sound quality is good, please make sure to mute yourself and stay on mute unless asked to come off and ask a question. To mute your audio, please, please click on the microphone icon in the menu bar. For the best presentation quality, we recommend turning your webcam off as it tends to utilize a lot of data and can cause the program to lag for you. To turn off your webcam, you can click on the camera icon in the menu bar. If you have any questions or comments during the presentation, please type them into the chat box. You can access the chat box by clicking on the message bubble icon in the menu bar. The chat will be monitored to ensure that questions and comments are not missed and will be shared with Dr. Osborne at the end of the presentation when the question and answer session will occur. Unfortunately, technology is not infallible, so please bear with us as we troubleshoot any technical issues that might arise. Our goal is to give everyone as smooth an experience as possible. However, we also know that life happens and we'll do everything in our power to get the presentation back on track as quickly as possible. And now let me introduce Dr. Travis Osborne. Dr. Travis Osborne is a clinical psychologist who specializes in the treatment of anxiety and related conditions, including hoarding disorder. He is the clinical director of the Evidence-Based Treatment Centers of Seattle, as well as the director of the Anxiety Center of, at EBTCS. Dr. Osborne has served as a consultant for the OCD and Hoarding Support Group of Seattle for over 15 years and has had multiple appearances on the television show Hoarding Buried Alive on the Learning Channel. He is also a clinical instructor with the Department of Psychology at the University of Washington, where he provides clinical supervision for doctoral students in clinical psychology. And now, Dr. Travis Osborne. Thank you very much and welcome everyone and thank you for being here this evening. Um, as um, just stated, we're going to have a talk tonight about uh, understanding hoarding disorder. I'm going to apologize in advance. I had COVID a couple weeks ago. I have a little bit of a cough lingering and the smoke here in Seattle is not helping with that. So I'll do my best uh, as we move along this evening. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen um, and share some presentation slides uh, with you all, which hopefully you will be able to see shortly. Can someone confirm uh, via audio that you can see these slides? I can see them Great. and I can hear you just fine. Perfect, thank you so much. Okay, <clears throat> well to get started, I just wanted to give you a brief overview of kind of what we'll be covering tonight. And as was mentioned a little bit ago, if we can hold questions till the end, that would be Is ideal. We'll have plenty of time uh, to answer questions mm -hmm. at the end of the talk this evening, uh, which will allow us to kind of get through all the content on time and get everything covered. Uh, so first, we're just going to talk about an overview of what are these uh, symptoms or criteria of hoarding disorder. So if someone comes into a mental health professional, what are the kinds of questions that we ask and what are the things that we're looking for to make a diagnosis? And then we'll cover some of the research about what we know about people who struggle with hoarding behaviors and then talk real specifically about what are the components of compulsive hoarding and acquiring. So what are the different behavior patterns um, that we end up targeting in treatment? And then we will talk a bit tonight about what the treatment approach uh, for this problem looks like, as well as some common obstacles to people um, participating in treatment. Then we'll talk about some resources, both here locally for those folks who are in Seattle, but other resources that can be accessed for folks who are outside of Seattle as well. And as I mentioned, we'll uh, leave plenty of time to do some questions and answers uh, at the end. So if you do have questions, go ahead and put them in the chat. Um, or wait to the last uh, portion of the talk and you can chime in with those. Okay, so let's get started. So just in terms of thinking about what are we talking about? So one thing that's really important when talking about hoarding is a little bit of history here. So the DSM or the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders is the kind of mental health um, kind of manual that all mental health providers use when they're going to make a diagnosis. So just as if you go to a medical provider um, and they are gonna provide you with a diagnosis for a specific physical problem, you have to have a certain number of physical symptoms to meet um, the, the diagnostic criteria for that, uh, mental, that medical condition. Well, the same is true for mental health as well. And so we have a, a very 
extensive and kind of clearly laid out <clears throat> set of symptoms for all the different types of mental health conditions um, that we might diagnose somebody with. So in that, in that manual that we have, uh, prior to the most recent edition, which was in 2013, hoarding was actually considered a subtype of obsessive compulsive disorder or OCD. And there was no official hoarding diagnose, diagnosis, which also meant there was no actual criteria that mental health professionals could use when they were trying to do an assessment when somebody has these symptoms. And what that meant is it made assessing hoarding symptoms very difficult because we had no standardized way to ask people about those symptoms. And what it also led to was a really significant lag in developing treatment research. And the reason for that is, at least in mental health, I think this is true in medical, um, the medical world as well, most research is tied to specific diagnoses. And so if there isn't a specific diagnosis for a problem, there really isn't a lot of money or energy put into treatment development. And so because hoarding was not its own diagnosis, uh, we really had very little um, in the way of um, treatment development happening until relatively recently. <clears throat> so that context is important because we're actually pretty far behind um, uh, in, in the area of hoarding than we are with things like depression or different types of anxiety or lots of other very common mental health problems in terms of um, the research um, and treatment development. And that's an important context to remember this evening. So hoarding did become its own disorder um, in 2013, as I mentioned, in response to a number of different, really important research findings. And the first one was that as they started to do some more studies, surveys of people um, around the United States, what they found is that hoarding was actually more common than OCD. And so since hoarding had been considered a subtype of OCD, it immediately became clear that a subtype cannot be more common than the disorder that it's part of itself. Um, so something right off the bat was kind of a miss there. The next thing that research discovered is that many people who struggle with hoarding behaviors don't actually have any other type of OCD symptoms. Um, so there's a lot less overlap between these two things than we thought. <clears throat> but the real driver for this change was that the treatments that we were using for OCD uh, for decades, um, when hoarding was considered a part of OCD, turned out when we looked a little more closely, just really did not work very effectively for hoarding. So this also gave us all of these things together, gave us this um, pretty clear sense that hoarding is its own distinct problem, needs to be established as such, um, and researched as such. And that, in the past nine years or so, has really started to kind of advance the science around what we know about this particular problem. Well, like I said, that means we're still in a lot of the early stages of figuring it out as compared to many other problems where we have, you know, many decades of research um, to back that up. <clears throat> so in terms of what the criteria for hoarding disorder actually look like, so if somebody comes into a mental, to see a mental health professional to get an assessment to see if they might have hoarding disorder, these are the kinds of things that we'd be looking for. The first one is a persistent difficulty with getting rid of things regardless of their actual value. Um, so it could be you know, difficulty getting rid of things that are have cost a lot of money or expensive, but it could also be difficulty getting rid of things that don't cost anything or did not cost anything to the individual. That difficulty is usually linked to the individual having a need to save things and a lot of distress in getting rid of them. And this is a big part of what we tend to think of with hoarding is just a lot of difficulty with actually letting things go. Um, that could be um, you know, throwing things away. It could also be donating things. It could be just getting rid of things that aren't used. Um, but the sort of typical letting go process that we all go through you know, throughout a given year, cleaning out closets, maybe donating things, getting rid of old things, things that don't fit anymore. Um, those kinds of, of processes are really difficult. Uh, for folks who struggle with hoarding. And then what happens is that difficulty with getting rid of things really results in a lot of possessions building up and leads to a lot of clutter um, in people's homes. And this is maybe kind of the hallmark that we tend to think of with hoarding is homes or living spaces that just are really full, really hard to use in the way they're intended. Um, and that's a pretty key thing. So you know, somebody might not be able to sit and eat at their kitchen table, for example, because perhaps the whole table is cluttered with items or 
Perhaps somebody actually can't sit on the couch or any of the chairs in their living room because they might be covered um, with their possessions or piles of things in their belongings. And then sometimes if there are spaces in the home that are uncluttered, it could be because the intervention of third parties. So it could be that they're living with family members, a spouse or kids, and those people are kind of moving things out of the way to create space. Or in some cases, there might be um, people like landlords or other kind of authorities, legal authorities who might be involved, who are kind of requiring that some of those spaces be cleared. <clears throat> For some people with hoarding, um, they have what we call excessive acquisition, which is essentially um, excessive kind of bringing things into the home. Um, and so some people with hoarding uh, problems, basically it's kind of a slow accumulation of things over time. So over the course of a lifetime of not getting rid of things, the clutter kind of slowly builds over a period of decades. But for other people, and that's who this would refer to, um, they're actively bringing things into their home at a really rapid um, rate and spaces can fill up um, really quickly. We definitely wanna know if that's happening. And then something that's pretty unique that I think is a really important um, kind of discussion point is that we also have to specify whether the person's insight or their awareness into the nature of the problem is good, poor, or absent. And the reason this is really important is there's very few mental health conditions where we're actually required to make this assessment. And I think what that speaks to is that there's actually a relatively high percentage of folks supporting who actually fall into this poor or kind of absent insight level. And so what that means is a lot of people who struggle with hoarding behaviors don't tend to seek treatment. Um, they might not be interested in seeking treatment. And a lot of times they might be actually getting a lot of pressure from other people, it could be family members, or again, people like landlords or other people kind of pushing them into treatment as opposed to seeking treatment themselves. I certainly see that as a mental health professional, way more families of people who struggle with hoarding come to see me to get advice about how to encourage their loved one to seek treatment then folks with these difficulties tend to come into treatment um, themselves. Now, that's not to say that nobody does that. There's still a large chunk of folks who struggle with these behaviors who have good to fair insight. And if they recognize it, we'll often then seek out help um, and seek out care for that. And then the behaviors have to cause some kind of distress or impairment. That could be um, you know, limiting people's social lives because oftentimes people can't have people over to their homes. In some cases, it might get in the way of people's work functioning. Um, some people struggle with hoarding even in the workplace. So their workspaces or their desks or things could be pretty cluttered and that could cause problems for them. Um, but also it could be just difficulties with maintaining a safe environment um, in one's home because of the clutter, because of the hoarding behaviors. But it has to cause some kind of problems for it to be considered a disorder. These would be the kinds of symptoms that we're looking for. And the last thing would be that the hoarding behaviors are not accounted by some other kind of medical or neurological condition that the individual might have. And we'll talk a little bit toward the end about some other conditions where hoarding-like behaviors can show up, um, but they really are a separate problem and not hoarding per se. So the development of this new diagnosis in 2013 has had tremendous benefits, um, even in just the last decade. So we have much greater awareness and recognition of hoarding as a problem. It's really helped with increased accuracy of diagnosis because we now actually have very specific diagnostic criteria that mental health professionals can use to, to lead to a diagnosis, which we did not have before. Because it is now a diagnosis, there's been a big increase in funding for treatment research because of that link I mentioned earlier between diagnosis and research dollars. And it also allows us to train mental health professionals a lot better because we now have these standardized criteria to use um, to train them with. Um, and we also just have a much better understanding than we did a decade or so ago about how hoarding and OCD are actually very separate problems. Um, uh, which has been very helpful um, in the mental health field as well. So huge benefits, you know, in this last decade from this change. And I suspect in the next 10 to 20 years, we're going to know, you know, way more than we know now um, because of these changes, but already seeing pretty significant changes as a result. So if someone is wondering if themselves or someone that they care about might have a hoarding problem, 
one of the ways that I like to think about um, where someone falls is on this continuum of problems with stuff. And this is kind of how I think about this. These are my own thoughts here, not, not drawn from somebody else's research or anything like that, but this is how I think about it. So on the one end of this continuum, like we all have to have possessions and belongings and things that we need in day-to-day -day life. And then we all have things that we want that we don't necessarily need, but that we like to have, want to have. And, and all of that stuff adds up to the kind of stuff or belongings that each of us has in our lives. And so one end on this continuum of problems with stuff would be people who are minimalists. These are folks who maybe have relatively fewer possessions than the average person. They don't acquire or buy that much stuff. They get rid of things when they don't need it. They're often pretty organized. I usually joke that, you know, these people's homes kind of look like the Ikea catalog. You know, they're pretty minimal, pretty organized. Um, there's not a lot of extra stuff lying around. Kind of one step up from that would be what I think of as kind of the average consumer, and we'll say average American consumer, because this can certainly vary worldwide. But these are folks who are buying things or acquiring things at a pretty typical rate. Um, they may build up over time, just like for all of us, but then they can generally get rid of things when they need to. So maybe a couple times a year, they do like spring cleaning or, you know, clean out the closets, clean out the garage at different times of year, donate things, throw things away that are broken or they don't use anymore. Um, and so when stuff builds up, they kind of get on top of it fairly easily. No real emotional difficulties letting go of things, and they tend to be pretty organized. A question we get asked a lot is, what is the difference between hoarding and collecting? Because uh, a lot of people with hoarding, it's a more comfortable term to think of themselves as collectors, which makes sense, because I think there certainly can be some stigma um, socially around the term hoarding, and there's a lot less stigma around the notion of collecting. Well, collectors, it's true, do often acquire a lot of things. Um, and often um, they have you know, many, many things or many, many collections even. They might collect multiple kinds of things. But usually it is limited to certain types of things that they have an interest in um, um, and is pretty focused on those interests. And they might have difficulty getting rid of items in their collections, but they don't really have any difficulty getting rid of anything else that they own. Um, so they could get rid of other things kind of with similar ease as most folks. Um, and then a big difference too is that the collections themselves tend to be very organized or even highly organized. They tend to be displayed um, in people's homes and people then usually get a lot of enjoyment about sharing those displays, sharing those collections with other people. So it wouldn't be unusual for people who collect different kinds of things if people come over to their homes to be pretty excited about showing those things off, sharing those things with other people um, and kind of encouraging people to, to look at those things, you know, talk about those things. And that's a really different picture than what we see um, with folks who struggle with hoarding as we'll talk about in just a minute. One step up from that, I tend to think of uh, problems with disorganization or clutter. And these might be folks that have attentional problems, so things like ADHD, attention deficit disorder, um, or other kinds of neurologic conditions um, that might make it hard for them to um, keep uh, kind of organizational systems up um, for various kind of cognitive reasons. They might have different cognitive problems that make that hard. And these folks probably acquire things at a typical or maybe slightly above average rate. Um, they might have some difficulties getting rid of things but honestly, if somebody came in and said, hey, I'd, I'd be happy to help you kind of go through things, clean them out, get rid of things, they would really welcome that input because it's hard for them to do or to kind of get organized around. Um, and they have ongoing problems with clutter and creating and maintaining organization systems because those just aren't their strong suits kind of at a brain cognitive level. But the key difference here is they're really not very attached to their belongings and could get rid of things pretty easily, uh, particularly, like I said, if they had help and would probably welcome the help. For other folks uh, on the far end, we have hoarding uh, disorder where there's just too many possessions. The things have kind of taken over the home or the living space. These folks have really significant difficulties with getting rid of things, lots of emotional distress at the thought of and the practice of doing that. They generally have a lot of challenges with getting and staying organized. And if other people come in to help, um, it actually often 
doesn't go so well because uh, it can be very anxiety provoking for the person who, who is struggling with hoarding behaviors. It can often lead to a lot of conflict. Um, it doesn't tend to be feel helpful or comforting to a lot of these individuals. And unlike collectors who like having people into their homes, like showing off the things that they have, sharing them with other people, most people with hoarding really don't want other people seeing their space, uh, seeing their living space, being in their home. Sometimes they can have a lot of feelings of shame or discomfort around that. Um, so a very different kind of emotional picture than what we might see with collecting. So this is where I think, you know, all of us as humans fall somewhere, you know, on or in between this spectrum. And so that's something you can just sort of reflect on for yourself, sort of where do I fall kind of along this continuum? So in terms of the research about what we know with people with hoarding behaviors, we don't have a ton of research because again, this literature is only about 10 years old, but we do have uh, some pieces of information that can be helpful to share. So previously it was believed that hoarding was pretty uncommon with only about one to 2% of the population struggling with these behaviors. So newer studies have found that hoarding might actually be a lot more prevalent than we thought with newer estimates from about two and a half to 5%. 5% might sound like a small number relative to the total population, but for mental health conditions, 5% is actually a really huge number. Um, and if 5% of the population really does turn out to meet criteria for hoarding, we're talking about something that is affecting many, many, many millions, um, tens of millions really of people, um, which is just a much bigger problem than uh, we would have initially guessed or most people might guess. <clears throat> In terms of gender differences, a lot of studies typically had found that um, there were no real differences. So men and women tend to engage in these behaviors around the same rates. Um, but a couple of newer studies have found that men might actually be twice as likely to engage in these behaviors as women, which would be a little bit of a difference of what we sort of see kind of depicted in the media, um, some of the TV shows that have come out where um, in general, I think more women tend to be depicted in those, um, those types of settings than men do. But the research suggests that may be wrong, in fact. And in terms of what this looks like across the lifespan, some studies have found that there really aren't many age differences in hoarding, but some newer ones do suggest that we might see more severe problems in older adults and younger adults. This doesn't surprise me that much because really a key variable uh, with this problem is time, so the accumulation and buildup of possessions over time. And it really can take decades for that to develop into a significant problem. And younger folks who struggle with these behaviors just really haven't had a lot of time for those things to build up yet. Um, so it makes sense that we're going to see more significant problems kind of into mid-late life for a lot of people. There's not been a lot of research that looks at what other mental health conditions that people who struggle with hoarding might have, but we do have one pretty good sized study with over 200 people um, who met the criteria that we talked about for hoarding um, and looked at what other mental health problems did they meet criteria for. And the big one that jumps out is just over half of people who have hoarding meet, meet criteria for clinical depression or what we call major depressive disorder. So that's a huge number. This is dramatically higher than the rates of depression in the general population. And so, you know, this is going to be a major factor for, uh, again, up to about half of people who struggle with hoarding. Several different types of anxiety are also very common um, in this population. So close to a quarter of people with hoarding have what we call generalized anxiety disorder, which is just a fancy term for like really excessive worry. These are folks that are worrying daily about a whole host of things, and that can lead to a lot of anxiety symptoms. Close to a quarter have social anxiety, um, which is interesting when you think about the fact that many people with hoarding would feel very uncomfortable with people coming into their home and would kind of limit a lot of their kind of socializing, particularly in their home, that about a quarter of these folks also have a lot of just anxiety about being in social situations in general. And then just under 20% have OCD. This is an important finding because as I mentioned earlier, Hoarding used to be considered a subtype of OCD, um, but only about 18% of folks with hoarding have other OCD symptoms. So this was a big reason why these two disorders kind of split off and divided into two. Another really, really important um, kind of discovery from this research is that a lot of folks with hoarding have 
um, attentional disorders, so ADHD, um, so problems with maintaining attention, with organization, with completing tasks, with up to a third of folks having that inattentive type of ADHD, which is really where we see lots of difficulties with staying and getting organized and um, getting things done, which a lot of folks with hoarding struggle with. So things that really jump out to me as kind of a take home depression is really significant in this population. Many different types of anxiety show up and then these attentional symptoms are really um, important too. I'm gonna skip over this last point for now because it's not as relevant. So the other thing that research has looked at is what happens with hoarding symptoms over the course of time. And this study was a really large study, probably one of the largest studies we have over 750 folks um, with hoarding symptoms were asked various questions about how this played out over time. What they found is that the vast majority, so 70% of people said that their hoarding behaviors started before the age of 21. So although this is a problem that tends to get severe kind of in mid to late life, as I mentioned, once time has elapsed, the tendency toward these behaviors, the saving behaviors, difficulties getting rid of things, typically start uh, before the age of 21, often showing up in even childhood and teenage years, we can see these tendencies. It was very rare for people to have late onset. So less than 4% of people said these problems started after age 40. So this really is something that starts in early life, but often doesn't tend to become a problem until this next line here. Symptoms don't really become moderate to severe until midlife, so between 40 and 70. And three quarters of people said that these symptoms were chronic, meaning that once they started, they were really with them sort of over the long haul. This was not a problem that for most people tended to go away on its own. Um, so only about, I guess that would leave about a quarter of people would say that this is something that kind of went away by itself. Uh, for most people, this is going to be something that sticks around until they get help. There also was some research that looked at the relationship between stressful life events and hoarding symptoms. And interestingly, what they found is that 75% of people um, in this sample of folks that struggled with hoarding reported some kind of history of interpersonal violence. That's compared to the population at large. So if you look at um, how many women, for an example, in the general population have experienced that, it's about 32%. So this is kind of double, more than double kind of the typical rates um, in the general population. And what they found was that um, episodes of interpersonal violence or disruptions in relationships, so things like breakups, divorces, losses, those kinds of things, were associated with times when the symptoms tended to get worse. And that was strongest for folks when symptoms started a little bit later. So that tells us a couple of things. People often ask me, like, is hoarding a result of trauma? And the answer to that is no. The majority of people who experience trauma do not develop hoarding symptoms. But what we do know is that many people with hoarding have experienced different kinds of interpersonal um, violence and, and, and difficulties, and that those things often you know, make those symptoms worse or kind of accelerate those symptoms. But they don't, they're not necessarily the cause um, to begin with. <clears throat> So let's talk now about the three different components of hoarding disorder. So the first thing we're going to talk about is acquiring behaviors. So this is, again, as I mentioned, many people who hoard do have problems with bringing things into their home, more things than they need or that they can use. Um, and for some people that happens very gradually or slowly, but for some people that can happen very quickly, they can fill up spaces very quickly. Lots of different ways that people can acquire things. Buying obviously is a, is a very common one. And ways that that tends to show up are people buying things that are on sale, things that they feel is a good deal, maybe going to things like yard sales or finding things that are kind of special or unusual. Um, people will also pick up things that are free. So they might see things on the side of the road. They might think, see things on the free section of Craigslist or Nextdoor or FreeCycle, all the different kind of free sharing apps and websites that are available now. Sometimes people might see things in the trash or dumpsters and sort of rescue them from there or pick up just free things that are out in the world, pamphlets, flyers, catalogs, all those kinds of things. Very tiny percentage of people um, with hoarding might engage in stealing behaviors as a means of acquiring, but that's not really something that's typical and not something that we really see. 
some people who struggle with hoarding also tend to get multiples of things um, when they acquire them to make sure that at least they'll have at least one um, when it's needed. So for example, in the case of like the free flyers or pamphlets, they might pick up three or four of each just to make sure that if they lose one or one gets damaged, that they actually have something available when they need it. Likewise, if they buy things at the store, they might buy multiples of something um, to make sure that they have it. And what you could imagine is, I mean, we can, sometimes all of us might buy, a, you know, multiples of a thing here or there because there's a specific need to do so. But if you're doing that in kind of a broad way, um, you can really fill up a living space very quickly um, if, uh, if you're getting multiples of things because the clutter just multiplies real fast. It can be really hard for people to walk away from things that they see out in the world or online that they want to acquire, um, either due to worries that they might regret it later, that they won't be able to find it later, maybe won't be able to get that price again later. A lot of those kind of thoughts give rise to those um, behaviors, but really tough to walk away from those things. And then for most people, the act of acquiring is usually associated with good feelings in the moment. So people might feel happiness, joy, satisfaction, um, you know, kind of excited that they found a good deal or something that was really interesting. But then later, often negative feelings like guilt or shame or remorse tend to pop up. And that could be for many reasons. One, it could be when they're then back at home and kind of seeing all the clutter that they have and realizing that these behaviors are just perpetuating the problem. It could be that they're spending maybe more money than they really can afford to. Um, but so we kind of see this like initial positive feelings followed by some negative feelings usually. Next component is saving behaviors, which is really kind of one of the things we think of as a hallmark of this problem. So lots of difficulties with getting rid of things. Sometimes people can describe that getting rid of things feels like they're almost getting rid of a part of themselves or their identity or their history. <clears throat> getting rid of things can lead to a lot of different intense feelings. Some people it's anxiety. For other people, it's going to be more feelings of like sadness and loss and regret. Sometimes if people are feeling pushed to get rid of things, the emotion will really be things more like anger and frustration. Um, but a whole wide range of really difficult emotions can come up when people are trying to get rid of things. Um, as I mentioned, if other people are pushing to get rid of things, this can lead to a lot of conflict. We see this a lot in families or spouses where this is an issue. Um, and so those intense feelings um, that come up when people try to get rid of things are usually a big part of why they might not um, actually spend a lot of time trying to do that. It's just emotionally very painful. And so there's usually a lot of avoidance of uh, working on getting rid of things, sorting through the clutter, and making decisions about what to do with things. And so if you have acquiring, whether it's fast or slow, and you have saving behaviors, and if you add time, you will get clutter. So clutter is almost always going to be an outgrowth of this. Um, as we mentioned earlier, it really prevents people from living in their homes or living spaces as it was designed. In very extreme conditions, it can lead to pretty poor living conditions. So people might have lack of access to stove or heater or water. This is how this often works is that um, these things will break, water heater will break or stove will break or pipe will break um, as they break in all homes over time. But because many people with hoarding are very reluctant or embarrassed to have people into their homes, they often won't call repair people to actually fix these things. So if something breaks, it's just sort of broken and it doesn't get fixed and then they don't have some of the basic um, things that they need to live safely. That can happen with heat, air conditioning, any appliances, all those kinds of things. And for some people, if they have difficulty getting rid of things like trash, those things may pile up and create some really difficult situations it can lead to pests and insect problems and just kind of sanitation problems in general. And then another contributor to the clutter is many folks with hoarding also have a lot of problems with things that are really essential for staying organized and kind of keeping an organized home. And some of those things are difficulties with attention and concentration, difficulties with memory, remembering where I put things if I put them away. So they might tend to leave them out in the open where they can see them, which can lead to more clutter. Difficulties making decisions. So even if they want to try to get rid of things, having a really hard time deciding, like, is this something I should keep? Is this something I should get rid of? Difficulties with categorizing things. And where that comes into play is um, if you're going to 
sort of organize your closet, organize your drawers. It really helps to be able to put things that should go together together. Um, and a lot of folks with hoarding have a, a lot of difficulty with kind of those kind of categorization uh, types of tasks. And then related to that difficulties with creating organization systems like filing systems, um, they can sometimes find that they are kind of too detailed and have so many categories that actually is like really hard to find things. Or maybe that they're not detailed enough and too much stuff is collapsed together that they also can't find things when they need them. So those systems kind of tend to break down um, and be really hard for them to maintain. So all of these kinds of problems can also contribute to those difficulties of clutter. So when we think about kind of a model for how hoarding develops and continues, <clears throat> we know that everybody with hoarding and any mental health condition has their own personal as well as family vulnerabilities that can contribute. In this case, family vulnerabilities might be things like having had parents or grandparents who lived through the Great Depression, as an example, who had kind of a really high cultural value at the time on not getting rid of things, saving anything that could be used again, really being frugal with resources and, and possessions. And if those messages were kind of heavily reinforced in one's family, if you have kind of a predisposition to those problems, those can be really challenging whereas they might not be for somebody who doesn't have those predispositions. Personal factors could be some of the things we mentioned before, things like having gone through different interpersonal stressors, could be things like having other mental health conditions or medical conditions that make it really hard for you to do all the physical labor involved in kind of cleaning up your house, getting it organized, all those kinds of things. And then as I just mentioned, all those kinds of information processing difficulties, so like attention problems, concentration, memory, decision-making, all those kind of difficulties can contribute too. And these lead to a whole series of thoughts and beliefs about belonging. So some of them I mentioned before. So I need to hang on to this because I might use it someday. Or maybe somebody I know could use this, so I'm gonna keep it for them and give it to them later. Or I'm never going to find another one of like these again. So I really should take advantage of this opportunity and get it now. All of these beliefs we all can fall into, but if they kind of drive our daily decision making around bringing things into our home and getting rid of things, you can see how they really would lead to, you know, acquiring a lot of things and getting rid of very few things, um, which really kind of sets people up, sets a lot of traps for people from a hoarding perspective. <clears throat> Those thoughts lead to a lot of emotional responses. So if I believe that um, I better hang on to this because I'm really going to need this someday, and I think if I get rid of it, I might not have it, that could cause someone to feel kind of anxious or unprepared. Um, or if somebody really believes like these things that are very sentimental to me, if I get rid of them, I'm kind of losing a part of myself, part of my identity, a part of my history. That, you know, that can feel quite sad um, and, and could feel like a loss. And, and those different emotions that come up, those hard emotions that come up will often lead people to then um, avoid making those choices and to just keep things. So those really lead to these difficulties with getting rid of stuff and then the clutter just perpetuating. Um, so when someone comes in for treatment, we really wanna look at kind of each of these components and kind of build a very individual model for this particular person of how the hoarding is operating for them so that we can then help them start to learn ways to change these behaviors, <clears throat> which brings us to the topic of treatment. So as I mentioned, treatment research is lagging very far behind. Some of the early research didn't start until the 90s, but really we started getting research, you know, just about 10 years ago of looking into a treatment that was really specifically targeted to these behaviors that we're talking about today. And one of the reasons this became obvious is the treatment for OCD, which we won't get into today, but is something called exposure and response prevention. It's the type of therapy that's been found most effective for the treatment of OCD. What they found is that that treatment worked really well for OCD, but it worked really terribly for people with hoarding. So when they pulled out the data for the people who had hoarding behaviors, what they found is this treatment just isn't working for these folks. Something is very different is happening for them and it's happening for all these other types of OCD where this treatment works very well. And so what that led to really is in the last 10 years, a complete redevelopment of kind of the treatment approach um, for hoarding behaviors. And now we have a type of treatment that is specifically designed for hoarding that we did not have, you know, 10, 15 years ago at all. <clears throat> 
That treatment is a type of cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT. That's a term that some of you may have heard before. Um, if you have some familiarity with the mental health world um, that addresses the different factors that maintain these hoarding behaviors. And so what's important, I wanna make you know, one other key take home from this talk is there really is currently only one treatment that has been found to be effective for hoarding. Um, and it's a type of CBT that we'll talk about today. And there is a treatment manual available for any of you who might be treatment providers. We'll talk about it at the end. But what that means is if folks are going to treatment and they're not getting this treatment, they're not getting a treatment that has any evidence, uh, research support um, behind it. Um, and that's a really important take home. So the treatment just at a high level involves uh, teaching people a number of different sets of skills. So one of the big things that we target are these thought patterns and beliefs that really kind of give permission for people to keep engaging in these behaviors. So some examples would be ones that I recently mentioned. So these thoughts that like, I should hold on to this because I could use it someday, or I'm gonna hang on to this and give this to somebody someday. Um, or if I sort of let go of these things, I'm kind of letting go of a big part of my life or my identity. All of these thoughts lead to kind of saving and acquiring behaviors. So if folks are gonna change those behaviors, they're gonna have to learn how to change these thoughts. And so there's a, there's a form of therapy strategies called cognitive therapy that we really help people first identify what are some of these unhelpful thoughts that are coming up for you that are leading to these hoarding behaviors and then teaching people how to challenge those thoughts and replace them with thoughts that are more accurate and more helpful. So for example, most of us could make a case for most things that we could use it at some point in the future. You could make an argument for that for almost anything, right? But the reality is if we all live that way, then we don't ever get rid of anything. And then we have a lot of clutter that's really gonna make our homes pretty unworkable. So on some level, we have to be able to have the thought, yeah, I could probably use this someday, balanced with other kinds of thoughts, but, but what's the likelihood I'm actually gonna use it? Have I ever used it so far? Am I likely to use it the next year or two? And if I'm not, then I probably shouldn't hang on to it because then I've just got clutter that's not being used. So teaching people ways to kind of break apart these thought patterns, look at them in a different way and generate other thoughts that are gonna help them um, get, get rid of things when that's needed. To tackle the acquiring behaviors, we do something called exposure therapy, which is helping people face situations that they want to avoid or face situations that are hard for them. What this looks like for acquiring is it's helping people identify where are the spots where you're really vulnerable to buying things or picking up things? Is it online shopping? Is it actually physically being in a store? Is it yard sales? Is it like the free stuff, you know, available online? Where are your kind of sensitive spots where you're more likely to get stuck and gonna acquire. Then we'll have people practice going to those places, either online if it's virtual shopping or in real life if it's kind of stores or locations, and then interacting with things that they want and then walking away without getting them, which is something that for a lot of people with hoarding is very difficult, but with practice becomes significantly easier. And then we do something similar to address the saving behaviors. So what we do there is exposure therapy to actually sorting through people's belongings and then making decisions about what to get rid of and then actually get, getting rid of it. Um, and this is really probably the bulk of the treatment and where the bulk of the time um, is involved. Because for most people with hoarding, they probably have you know hundreds to thousands of items in their home that they need to go through. And so you can imagine the amount of work that's involved of having to go through piece by piece and make a decision about every single thing in your home of what are we going to do with it. It's a lot of labor involved. And then the last piece is teaching people strategies to manage clutter and disorganization. So teaching people organizational skills, problem solving skills, how to set up a filing system, how to maintain those systems, all of those ways to kind of help ensure that once we've gotten rid of things, you've got systems in place to help keep your home in a more organized and kind of manageable level over the long haul. So all of these skills um, would typically be things that we would teach and kind of target in therapy. So some unique things about this treatment is unlike most mental health treatments where people kind of come to the office, come to a therapist's office for sessions, this treatment is done in the office, but also in people's homes whenever that's possible. Sometimes that's in face-to-face, -face, so the therapist comes to the home with 
you know, COVID over the last couple of years, obviously telehealth has become much more widely used. So we can also do this via telehealth with people too, where they're in their homes and we're in the office if they live too far of a distance from the office or things like that. But it's super important that treatment actually takes place in people's homes, either in reality or virtually, because that's where their belongings are. And that's where really the bulk of the work gets done. So kind of talking about getting rid of stuff doesn't tend to help. We actually need to do it together in sessions. So I myself, uh, when I have clients with hoarding, I go to their homes. We spend time actually sorting through their belongings together, making decisions about what to get rid of and doing that kind of in their space. Um, it can be really helpful to have an additional coach or a professional organizer, a family or a friend kind of helping the individual between sessions. This is a very active hands-on treatment where we are actually going through things and getting rid of stuff. Um, so we are not just talking. <clears throat> the treatment, as it was initially studied, was designed to be a minimum of 26 sessions, um, but can often take a lot longer for people to, to do that, depending on how motivated they are, how much stuff they have in their homes, how quickly they're able to make decisions. I would say for most people, this process takes a minimum of a year. Um, for some people with very crowded homes, it uh, can take you know, much more than a year, depending on how much work they're willing to put in. And a question we get asked a lot by families is like, well, what can we just go in there and just kind of clean the whole place out and like just do this real quickly? And the thing is, that doesn't tend to work um, for several reasons. One, it tends to piss people off um, and cause a lot of conflict um, and a lot of anger, understandably. If somebody came into my house and wanted to throw everything in a dumpster, I'd be pretty upset too. Uh, but the other thing that happens is doing that doesn't really teach the person any new skills. They haven't learned any skills for how to make decisions, how to decide what to acquire or get rid of how to talk back to the thoughts in their head that give rise to these behaviors. They haven't learned any skills for how to organize and manage their home. So there's no skill building whatsoever. So what that means is you might have like quick progress in terms of cleaning a place out, but it's not gonna stick because the person didn't learn anything new that they can actually use in the future. So what tends to happen is spaces just fill right back up, um, which of course is really frustrating for everybody involved. If you are gonna do a clean out, if you're gonna do it, you want to do it usually later in the process when the person is really motivated, really ready to change. They either feel it would be a great jumpstart or just really help advance their treatment. Um, but they are at a point in their therapy or treatment that they have learned a lot of skills and can now are kind of ready for kind of a big push to kind of help them. But that is rarely going to be helpful at the start. Um, also, it helps if there's a team of people that the person trusts. Again, this could be family, friends, professionals who can follow very specific rules that the individual has come up with that everybody agrees to follow. So they know that no one is going to be getting rid of things without their permission. Um, and it's part of a much broader plan that's going to address all those parts of hoarding that we talked about so that the person can have long term benefits and not just a short term benefit. And then professional cleaning or hauling companies can be really helpful to bring in when the person is ready to deal with things like dangerous or hazardous things that need to be removed. If there's large amounts of trash or recycling, lots of really heavy things that the person and the therapist or other helpers just can't move. Um, or if there's a lot of stuff that does need to be moved in a short period of time. Like let's say somebody has a deadline around like avoiding eviction or avoiding some other kind of penalty from their landlord or other housing facility. And a lot has to happen in a short time. Sometimes it can be helpful to bring folks in to really help get a lot done in a short amount of time, because often it's a lot of work um, to get from point A to point B. Quickly, in terms of medication, unlike most mental health conditions where we do have good medication options, to date, we really don't have specific medications that have been found to be consistently effective in treating hoarding. There's a little bit of new research that is starting to relook at that um, and is promising, but we really don't have kind of specific recommendations yet. This makes this very different than most other mental health conditions. So when we think about medication, what we do think about is how we're going to use them to treat other conditions that people might have that are getting in the way of them working on the hoarding. So when we mentioned earlier, depression, anxiety, ADHD, things that are very common in people with hoarding. We'll think about using medications to see, can we improve some of those conditions so that those symptoms don't make it even harder to do the work? Because you could imagine if you were clinically depressed, felt like you could barely get out of bed, didn't have the energy to even take a shower. If you're gonna think about spending hours a week trying to sort through your belongings and get rid of things, 
you're probably not really going to get too far. The depression is really going to get in the way. So if we can use medication to help treat people's depression and kind of remove that obstacle, sometimes people can then make a lot more progress in their treatment. That's mostly how we think about using medications in the treatment of hoarding problems. It's also true that most people with hoarding are going to need professional help to make significant progress. And that's really for two reasons. One, it's a very overwhelming problem. Um, and most people themselves are not necessarily going to know what the effective strategies are that have been researched um, to be able to kind of get out of that problem, um, which is where a mental health professional comes in. Um, but it's also really important to find professionals that have specific training in the treatment of hoarding. And although this is getting better in the last 10 years since hoarding became its own disorder, this is still incredibly hard to find. Um, so many cities, you know, will maybe just have a very tiny handful of providers. Uh, larger cities might have a very small number of providers that have any training. In a lot more smaller cities or more rural areas, often there are not any people with training in this problem. And so finding those professionals can be tough. I will say with COVID over the last two years and telehealth being now much more available than it ever was, it is a little bit easier to access folks with this um, training from a further distance um, than where some people might live. So that has certainly opened up some access, but it's still, it still can be a pretty challenging thing to find. The two types of professionals that people are gonna most tend to work with are gonna be therapists, so psychologists, therapists, social workers, those kinds of things, um, and then professional organizers. And professional organizers are not mental health professionals. They are really experts in helping people uh, clean up, organize, maintain systems in their home. Key there is most professional organizers don't have training in hoarding, but some do. And so finding professional organizers who work with hoarding specifically is really important because uh, they need to be able to kind of slow down, meet people where they're at um, and do it in a way that's gonna work for the person. <clears throat> and then oftentimes mental health professionals and professional organizers can work together. And I've done that successfully with some folks over, over the years. Um, and they both have kind of their own specialties, but then there are these places where they're both working on sort of the clutter in the home, but sort of a team approach, if it's possible, can also be helpful. Lots of obstacles can come up in treatment, so motivation for change can really vary. Again, as I mentioned, for a lot of people, this process can take a minimum of a year, sometimes several years. You can imagine just trying to keep up the motivation to change something that is hard over that long of a period of time. It makes sense why it would fluctuate. Some people, as we mentioned at the beginning, don't have really good insight into the nature of the problem. So they can just really have a hard time seeing that it is in fact a problem that they need to work on. A lot of people, their family members have tried to intervene in the past. And so they're just very concerned about other people trying to control them. This can lead to lots of family conflict about the hoarding, which can actually make people less likely to even seek help because uh, they're just so frustrated with other people's efforts to, to get in there and, and tackle it. Treatment takes a lot longer than for a lot of other mental health problems. So I mentioned that the treatment is a minimum of 26 sessions. It's quite a bit longer than other good treatments we have for things like depression, different types of anxiety. So this really is something that does take more time. It also takes physical labor, and that is very different than any other mental health problem in that it's just going to take as many hours as it's going to take to physically go through all of the belongings in somebody's home and make decisions about what to keep and what to get rid of. So those that process is very physically labor intensive, which for people who might have medical issues or pain issues or other health conditions or who are older adults, or maybe that's a little bit harder, um, all of those things can kind of make this a really challenging process. And again, it can be hard to maintain that any progress that somebody does make over the long term. Because the research on hoarding treatment is so new, we actually don't have a lot of data yet that tells us how are people doing like a year out, two years out, five years out, 10 years out to see does the treatment stick? Um, we're still kind of in the early enough phases that we don't have a lot of data yet about what's this look like over the long term. And then as I mentioned, those other problems like depression, anxiety, things like that can just make it difficult to focus on the hoarding itself if there are other mental health or medical or physical problems that are also um, showing up. So those all can make it a little bit harder. So one thing I wanna talk about quickly is this idea of harm reduction. So 
there's, as I mentioned at the beginning, a lot of people with hoarding are not either aware that they have a problem or interested in changing the problem, but could be in situations where they need to change this behavior or some pretty dire things are gonna happen. So they could be evicted, they could lose access to certain types of housing. If they live in certain types of housing facilities, those facilities often have rules that people have to follow uh, where they can't live there. Um, so when this is the case where somebody's not interested in changing, but some kind of change is needed, we take a very different approach. Um, we call this approach harm reduction. The goal is not to change or stop the hoarding behaviors. So we're not trying to prevent people from hoarding. We're not trying to create any kind of long-term change in hoarding. What we are trying to do is limit the amount of harm that those behaviors could cause them or other people. And so the steps for that would be, okay, what is the harm? So if there's an older adult, let's say in a home that's very crowded, there could be fall risks, different kinds of safety risks. Um, for certain types of people, if they have a lot of paper that they hoard, that can cause fire risks. If those papers are near things like stoves or um, electric heaters, those kinds of things. Um, so those are the different types of harms. Um, or another harm could be eviction. So if someone's in a housing facility where you, know, you aren't allowed to have your windows covered or doors blocked, um, and the hoarding is so severe that like exits, except maybe the main exit are blocked, and you kind of have to fix that or you can't stay there. These would be the kinds of things that can come up in these situations. So we figure out who's the team. A uh, team could be a therapist, could be family members, could be a landlord, it could be whoever's the, the people who are kind of most central and involved. And then come up with some kind of plan. So what are our goals? You know, so maybe in the case of an older adult with fall risks, you know, our goals are to keep you safe, to keep you in your home, to prevent you from falling. And to do that, we're gonna need to move or change a number of things here to prevent you from falling. So we'll create a contract about what that's going to look like. And that could be like not putting certain things in, you know, on the floor. It could be creating wide enough spaces that you can safely walk through particular areas um, and whatever the particular safety issues might be. And then a plan for how we're going to check in on that and what we're going to do um, if things kind of backslide and we have these, these um, risks are back. It's a very different approach to treatment. And what's important really is the attitude or the spirit of it. And the goal here is to build common ground. So what has often happened with people with hoarding with their loved ones or other authorities is a lot of conflict develops because people are pushing for change, pushing to get rid of stuff. And the person with hoarding is feeling very reluctant to do that or feels understandably very irritated or frustrated. And so we really wanna build like a very different approach. So where can we find some common ground? How do we kind of change any patterns of conflicts? We're gonna do that by kind of letting go, kind of past conflicts and ideas about what will help, really trying to understand things from the person's perspective who's struggling with the hoarding behaviors. Um, practice, you know, these are for the other folks, family members, authorities, like listening more than talking, really trying to empathize with the person's experience. Again, focusing on areas of agreement and partnering together and setting just really narrow goals. Um, and we're just gonna focus on that. And if those things are okay, then we're really not gonna talk about trying to get you to change the whole problem. So there's a whole book here um, I mentioned on this last page, this book called Digging Out, that if folks are in this situation, if you have a loved one that's not interested in changing, or you're part of a system where you run into these challenges, this just is a great guide that kind of how, outlines how to approach that process um, when treatment really isn't gonna be the goal. And I mentioned at the beginning that hoarding behaviors can show up in other kinds of conditions. Um, and so we want to just kind of be aware of those so that we can make sure that we're really dealing with hoarding and not some other problem. <clears throat> so schizophrenia, which is a psychotic disorder, where people have a lot of difficulty determining kind of what's real and what's not real. Sometimes you can see hoarding behaviors in the context of those um, psychotic belief systems. Um, what would make it really different from hoarding is you would have the presence of those other psychotic symptoms, which you really wouldn't see typically in a hoarding situation. For some people with eating disorders, they might engage in hoarding of food behaviors or not getting rid of food packaging or food waste, like when it's um, after it's been opened or used. And so you might see what looks like hoarding behaviors, but if it's really specific to food, you want to kind of do some assessment. Is this really more an eating disorder or is this actually a hoarding problem? In very severe depression, um, people just don't have the energy to keep up their homes. And if somebody has very severe depression for a long period of time, 
if you walked into their home, the state of the home could look like a hoarding situation where maybe just like things are not being put away. There's a ton of clutter. They're just not keeping up with cleaning or organization. But if depression really seems to be the driver of that, it's a very different um, problem than kind of hoarding per se. In certain types of brain injuries, if people get injured in certain types of the brain, we can see them actually start to engage in some of these hoarding behaviors. And again, the history of that brain injury would tell us that this is something kind of different. And similarly, in some forms of dementia, people can start engaging in hoarding behaviors really late in life, which again, as we talked about before, is incredibly unusual. Less than 4% of people develop hoarding after age 40. So if somebody is in their 70s or 80s um, and is suddenly starting to develop hoarding behaviors, you really kind of want to check maybe this could actually be a form of dementia or Alzheimer's. That's the cause and not a separate hoarding problem. We don't have a lot of research yet on knowing whether when these behaviors show up in these other conditions, if it's like a totally separate problem, if the things that we talked about today could be helpful for these, these folks, or if totally different approaches are needed. Um, and so we just don't have a lot of research to guide us. So I'd say, you know, try to treat one of these underlying conditions first and see if that contributes to some improvement in the behaviors, and then maybe try some of the strategies that we've discussed today. But in things like dementia, where the person is not, you know, we don't have cures or sort of good treatments for reversing dementia, you know, what we can imagine there is we're probably not going to be teaching people skills, but we're probably going to have to do um, intervene at kind of the environmental level of ways to kind of help maintain the person's safety in their space. They're probably not going to be learning sort of the skills to do that themselves. Talk quickly about resources. So because hoarding again started out as a type of OCD, the International OCD Foundation, which is kind of like the, the OCD version of the American Heart Association or the you know, the American Stroke Association, this is kind of the national level organization for OCD, has from the beginning and continues to provide information about hoarding. They do have a separate um, hoarding um, kind of set of resources that's moderated by the, some of the top experts in the world on hoarding disorder. It's a very reputable place to look for information. For those folks who are local, we're really lucky that we have a free OCD and hoarding support group here in Seattle. It is meeting virtually for the past two years because of COVID. Um, when it goes back to in-person, it meets at um, Swedish Hospital on First Hill. Uh, it meets on the third Saturday of every month, I believe, but the website is there. And they have uh, specific kind of breakout groups for folks with hoarding, but it's also open to family members and friends of people with hoarding, whether or not they are interested in attending. So both folks with hoarding can get support and also their family members and loved ones can also get support. And it's pretty unique to have a free support group like this um, available. Also, because it is being run virtually, right now, actually anybody could attend from anywhere. Um, you don't have to be here locally to access that. And a couple of books that are really key. <clears throat> if you were to buy one book on hoarding, whether you're someone who thinks you might have hoarding, whether you're a family member or whether you're a treatment provider, I would recommend this first book called Buried in Treasures. It's written by the developers of the treatment that we discussed today. And it's kind of their kind of lay person self-help book for the treatment of hoarding. And it's really good for folks who are struggling with hoarding. It's also great for family members to kind of understand hoarding better and also understand what's involved in the treatment. And it really outlines all the treatment strategies that we actually use in therapy. The next book would be kind of a more formal treatment workbook. So this would be for treatment providers to use with their clients. Um, written by the same folks using the same strategies, just kind of packaged in a more formal way. The book Stuff, also written by the same authors, is a great kind of deep dive into different aspects of hoarding disorder. If people are really interested in learning more about different features of what this looks like. This is really kind of case examples from folks that they've treated over the year, over the years. Digging Out is the book I mentioned a little while ago that really outlines what are we going to do when someone's not interested in treatment and we're going to take more of a harm reduction approach. This really outlines what that approach looks like. And this last book, The Hoarder and You, starts with the premise that's kind of similar to the continuum idea that I, that I mentioned toward the beginning of the talk, but this idea that like we all fall somewhere on a spectrum of difficulties with relating to our possessions and our things. And this idea that um, you know, we can all learn more about sort of where do we fall on our level of, of attachment to stuff um, and where do we fall on that spectrum.
all of these you can get on Amazon. All are probably less than $30. Many of them less than probably $20. So pretty easy to access. Um, just to kind of sum up, and then we'll do some questions. So as I mentioned, research you know, is still really in its infancy here. It's advanced a lot in the last 10 years, but there's a lot we don't know. There's a lot of research that's ongoing. There's genetic research that's ongoing right now. There's neuropsychological research trying to understand at like a neurological level, you know, what is happening for folks with these challenges. Lots of things we're gonna discover over the next 10 years. The decision to make hoarding its own disorder has been really pivotal kind of in developments here and it's gonna to lead to a lot of advances. And the initial research suggests that this new treatment approach that we talked about today is vastly more promising than the treatment approach we had before. Um, it's been studied in being delivered in a one-on-one -on -one format. It's been studied in delivery in group formats and support group formats. There's a lot of energy and research right now into to researching how do we get this treatment to people um, in lots of different ways. And we've come a long way with knowing what to do with hoarding, but there's a ton of work left to do. So, um, you know, we're, this is a much more hopeful time if folks are struggling with this condition. But it also, you know, can still be frustrating because there's a lot we don't know. Um, and there's a lot of research that we have left to do. I am going to stop sharing my screen if I can figure out how to do that. Oh, maybe I already did. Have I stopped sharing my screen? There we go. Stop sharing. There you go. go that looks there good. There we go. Okay. So we can either start with questions from the chat. That might be easier if there are any. And then there if not. Have, there have been um, kind of throughout the presentation, <laughs> though, then you answered them. So okay. know, um, I can tell you what they were, but I know that you did go through and answer okay. them. Yeah. The first one was, um, would treating associated conditions such as depression also alleviate hoarding symptoms? And then you <laughs> went into a little bit about that. Yeah, um, so people, I can say a little bit, another sentence about that. It would not help with the hoarding symptoms themselves. But what it would do is remove a lot of the barriers to working on the hoarding and make it easier to actually do the hoarding work. But we wouldn't expect that treating the depression would necessarily alleviate the hoarding itself. And there were a couple of questions about um, if we, they could have copies of the slides, which I told them that you were willing to do that after the program. Definitely. Um, yeah. And then the next question was, does current research use scans of brain activity? So there is um, brain research that is going on and there's a number of different kind of interesting studies that are happening around that. And we'll know more about this in the coming years, but I can talk kind of briefly about one particular study that was pretty interesting. They brought people with um, hoarding challenges and people who don't have hoarding challenges into a laboratory that had um, brain imaging available as they did the study. And then they also had people bring um, pieces of their own mail, so mail that they that was their mail. Um, and as part of the study, what they were shown is all the mail was kind of scanned uh, into a computer so they could show it to them on a computer screen. And then they also showed them pieces of mail that didn't belong to them, that belonged to other people. And so that what they were told is they would look at their own, they would look at these images of mail, some that was theirs, some that was other people's, and they had to make a decision in the study about whether that mail was going to get shredded. So they were going to have to get rid of it. And they were imaging people's brains as they <clears throat> were making these choices. And what was really interesting that they found is that for people who did not have hoarding, their brains really didn't do much when they decided to shred their own mail or somebody else's mail. Like nothing in their brain was particularly lighting up much when they did this. But for people with hoarding, when they were making decisions about their own mail, a bunch of parts in the brain related to emotion, related to decision making, or sort of like lighting up as they're making these choices, but not when they were asked to make choices about somebody else's mail. And so what's interesting about that is it shows both differences between people with hoarding and people without, but also that even within people with hoarding, the issue really is emotions related to their own belongings, not necessarily, you know, feelings or emotions related to somebody else's belongings or just the act of making a decision, right? Like they still had to make a decision with both, um, but they really, the emotional parts of the brain were sort of lighting up when they had to make decisions about their own mail. So this is just one kind of example of the kinds of studies that we're really trying to look at of like what is actually happening 
in different regions of the brain as people have to make these hard decisions. And I'm, I'm, I know we'll have more of those kinds of studies, you know, in the future. But so I would say, yes, that is starting. But getting access to those kinds of machines and research study is actually extremely expensive. And the time on those machines is, is very pricey. Um, so research on that is slow just because it takes a lot of money to do those kinds of studies. Fascinating. Um, the next couple of questions were about um, if the resources were going to be listed, which you then did. And yeah. then um, could concussions make a person vulnerable to these problems? That's a good question. Um, brain injury is not my specialty. Um, certain types of brain injury can, but it has to be, the brain injury really has to be at certain locations in the brain. And so it would probably depend on kind of where the person's kind of hit their head and had sort of the follow-up concussion symptoms um, because certain parts of the brain, if they were injured, would not necessarily lead to that. So I, I could say it's potentially true depending on where the brain injury actually happened. And again, brain injury is not my specialty, so I, I can't speak to that a ton, but it wouldn't necessarily be the case that just sort of any form of concussion would necessarily make people more vulnerable to this, but certain types of brain injury could. The next question, and they're flying into the chat now. Oh, good. Great. Um, is there a strategy to help those who might get evicted? One of my friends died while she was cleaning out her home of 40 years. She rented, but was given three months notice to leave because the yeah. owners wanted to sell. This is probably the hardest um, situation that comes up um, with this problem, because unlike almost every other mental health problem, be, there's a physical manifestation of it, right? Like most mental health problems, there's behaviors that people are doing or internal symptoms that they're experiencing, thoughts, emotions that are really hard to deal with. What's interesting with hoarding is there's this external manifestation of the problem in the form of all this clutter or stuff that can then cause other problems like sort of eviction risk. And then it takes a certain amount of time to actually go through people's belongings. So when somebody has like a three month you know, notice or a one month notice, like it actually isn't possible to go through everyone's belongings in a, in a, someone's belongings in a, that short of a time span, like it's, it's almost impossible. So people are then put in these really tough decisions. What I'd say is my, I, you know, earlier I said these large scale cleanouts are a pretty bad idea and they are as a general rule, a pretty bad idea. What I will say is if someone is in an eviction situation, um, that is the one time where I would consider people use that strategy just because if it keeps somebody in their home or you know in their housing um, it may be worth you know the distress that that causes but it would really have to be like that kind of an extreme um, situation another idea would be this sort of <clears throat> digging out protocol that i talked about which is can we get some agreement with a landlord that like, we're not necessarily going to get this place as cleaned up as you would like, but we are going to address like specific concerns that you have um, so that we have some agreement about around those issues. Um, but oftentimes what happens is people are forced to have to, to, to work just at a much faster rate than they are able to, or even have the resources to. Um, and Landlords don't understand that. I mean, obviously, landlords have a whole different set of concerns. They might be worried about their property, you know, being destroyed, et cetera. Um, but they don't understand that, like, this is a year long process, right? Or longer. You know, they just have like a time frame that they're going to say. So, well, I guess my short advice is there's not any great options. It's when I would consider clean outs. It's when I would consider can we get enough out, even if it's storing it somewhere else to like keep somebody in their home? Um, or can we work on this kind of like compromise with the landlord or other authorities around, we're not going to get this place cleaned out, but we can agree to do these things that need to be done. Those would be kind of the best options, but it's the, it's kind of the hardest situation to be in. The next question is animal hoarding treated the same as object hoarding. Great question. I actually had a slide about that and I took it out because nobody ever asks about it. Maybe they don't ask about it because I usually have the slide about it. Um, no, it is not. Um, so we know very little from a research perspective about animal hoarding. One of the reasons is it's actually pretty rare and relative to the other types of hoarding, it's extremely rare. And what we know is that of the little bit of research that's been done, 
folks with animal hoarding are significantly more likely to have no insight into their symptoms, which makes sense because in animal hoarding, what happens is people have an excessive number of pets and that's not, or animals are not always even pets. And that in and of itself is not a problem. It's, but the problem is that the animals are usually in very poor physical health. So they're either very sick, dying, not being well cared for. And then the environment is usually in really bad shape. Um, animals aren't being cleaned up after. Like these are really kind of pretty awful sanitary conditions. And it makes sense that these folks would be more likely to have no insight because you kind of would have to have no insight to not be able to see the reality of what is happening in front of you, that these animals are actually suffering when the individual believes that they're actually helping them. So we don't know a lot about treatment because these folks don't get treatment. They don't believe there is a problem. So treatment isn't really like what happens. What tends to happen, and this is kind of an important point, is that um, animal cruelty is actually a, 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 a legal offense. So you can actually be, it's a, it's a criminal offense, sorry. So you can actually be arrested and jailed um, in an animal hoarding situation. Whereas in a, in a object hoarding situation, that, that would be like almost never happened because like having too much stuff is not a crime. Now you might get evicted or you might get like a notice from the fire department, but you're not really going to go to jail typically over hoarding. With animal hoarding, you very well could go to jail. So it's kind of a whole separate issue because it has a whole separate issue of legal issues. And again, the insight is so poor that most of these folks don't actually want treatment. So the intervention is like remove the animals, right? It's not um, kind of treat the individual. It's just get the animals out of the house. I'm speaking in generalizations, but it, we know very, very, very little about sort of how to actually treat that problem. The next question was about what type of violence might be, or what type of violence might be an experience of the hoarder? So I, I when they, I, have, I don't remember this, I haven't looked at that study in a while, but inter, acts of interpersonal violence would probably include things like being physically assaulted, being sexually assaulted, um, being involved in physical altercations. That, that's what interpersonal violence would mean, um, so where another person is pretty intimately involved as opposed to like, you know, being in a, a, a war zone. That's a different kind of violence or, um, you know, experiencing sort of a violent accident where it's not necessarily like another person's involved. So some sort of violence like that, assault, sexual assault, those kinds of things that involve another person. So those would be the kinds of experiences that at least in that sample of people with hoarding had many more uh, kind of higher rates, much higher rates of those kinds of things happening in their lives, as opposed to kind of the average uh, person in the average population. The next question is about local resources. Um, this person is from Richland, and I would recommend that they come into our library. Um, we do have some books that are available to check out. Um, we also have another class coming up in a couple of weeks on decluttering downsize, not specifically sure. hoarding, but yeah. um, decluttering and clearing out your space. Um, the next question is on, do you have any advice for someone who is bipolar, has become a compulsive buyer, but feels like a collector since everything matches the criteria and is organized and is currently in treatment for bipolar? So this is a great example of hoarding, what looks like hoarding symptoms showing up in a different disorder. So when people are bipolar and are in a manic phase, which a manic phase would be the opposite of being depressed, it would be having a lot of energy um, not needing to sleep, doing lots of things, and then often doing a lot of impulsive things, which frequently can involve a lot of excessive spending of money or buying. So people could acquire like a lot of things during a manic phase if they were doing online or other shopping. So the treatment, and, and it makes sense that they would be organized because they probably don't actually have hoarding. They probably have a compulsive buying problem um, that is probably made worse when they're manic. So the key there would be to treat the bipolar disorder, to treat the mania. So medication is really the frontline treatment for, for bipolar disorder. So getting on a mood stabilizer that actually starts to kind of prevent someone from being in those manic phases so that we don't have the mania driving more of the compulsive shopping. But then the treatment is really going to be treatment for compulsive buying, um, which will share some components of the hoarding treatment, but will also be 
it's also different. It's a, it's a little bit more like an addiction model than kind of what we've talked about today. So more likely to be a combination of medication and then a treatment that looks a little bit more like addiction treatment. The next question, um, I'm going to read it. It's a little confusing. Okay. What if, what if a person has other responsibilities like sick relatives and also off work due to serious long-term unresolved issues, so not enough to live on, no social sec or no security of monies, and mm -hmm. catastrophic issues like city inspectors fear and them not understanding the need for team mm -hmm. and working together? Yeah, they're like the city officials aren't understanding that. Yeah. And this is not an uncommon situation. So one of the things I think that can be helpful about something like the support group that I mentioned is you will hear, you know, you'll hear other stories like this as well, where people really don't have a lot of resources. They have a lot of actual barriers to getting things done. And yeah, systems are not always terribly supportive. So if somebody has a you know fire code violation or has violated the, um, you know, kind of agreements or requirements of their housing facility. And that could be like a, you know, an elder care facility, or it could be, um, you know, some sort of community housing, or it could be um, section eight housing, or whatever, whatever it might be, they often have rules, right, that people have to follow. Um, absolutely, those authorities are not always educated on hoarding, or particularly empathetic, they just need people to meet follow the rules, clear things out by a deadline, which can be just incredibly, incredibly stressful. So I'd say in part, it depends on where it is. So for example, in, in King County, for example, we actually have a county level task force for hoarding and a lot of big cities do, smaller cities may not. And oftentimes the different agencies that are most often confronting hoarding problems are part of those task forces or somebody from those agencies are part of those task forces. And one of the things those task forces can do is help sort of advocate on behalf of what people with hoarding need in those situations. And so one idea would be to see is like, does your city actually have one of those task forces and to contact them and see like what, if anything, they might suggest or can do on your behalf, kind of with the agencies that they probably are already building connections with. So that's one idea. Another idea would be to see if you can work with anyone in your life who's willing to sort of advocate with you um, in conjunction with you with these agencies, because taking those agencies on as an individual is often very you know, daunting and, and can be pretty frustrating. So is there anyone in your life, could be a professional or not, um, who can actually advocate with you or on your behalf for the need to have some additional accommodation or time or negotiation or kind of things like that? Um, or see if there's a way to get connected with any other kind of social service agency or social worker who's also, you know, maybe willing to kind of help you negotiate or sort of work with folks on their behalf. But it can be frustrating because at the end of the day, if the city agency or uh, government agency just sort of holds the authority to make decisions, you know, they may or may not always kind of cooperate um, or, or kind of be willing to kind of cooperate or compromise um, with people. But those are some ideas that I would suggest. Um, the next question is, how do you find a therapist or person to help? And there's a kind of a follow-up question down below about local resources, or yeah. if there's anybody on this side mm -hmm. of the state you'd recommend. Yeah. Uh, what side of the state are you in referring We're, to? We're um, Eastern Washington. Eastern Washington. Okay. Um, so two ways. One is um, the International OCD Foundation that I mentioned that the link was to in the slides that I'll send out. They actually have a find a therapist tool. Um, where you can look in a particular geographic region and see what therapists are actually in that area or your state um, that treat both OCD, but they'll also list if they work with hoarding. Keep in mind, there'll be a lot fewer folks on that list that work with hoarding than work with OCD, but that's probably a, a good place to go because people who do that work are usually registered with that organization. So that's one way to find them. Another would be to contact hoarding task forces, if there is one in your city or nearby cities, or support groups. So for example, the support group in Seattle gets requests all the time from folks in the state looking for resources, and they will kind of help point people to people that they are aware of um, in different areas. I am not aware of anyone in Eastern Washington who treats hoarding. That doesn't mean there isn't, but I'm not aware of them. So there, there's not 
somebody who's kind of out there talking a lot about that. There are a handful of providers over here in Western Washington and all of the, virtually all of those folks certainly at this point are doing telehealth and so can reach you know folks on the eastern side um, of the state for sure. What do you think of psychologytoday.org as a place to find therapists? Yeah, actually, yeah. I, there's probably not a ton of people on there who have listings for hoarding, but yeah, that's definitely another good resource too because a lot of therapists are registered with Psychology Today. I think the key thing is no matter who you are going to work with, some things you want to think about. You definitely want to be meeting with a therapist who identifies as a cognitive behavioral therapist because if they don't, they're not going to be doing the treatment that we know works the best. So that's number one. Ideally, the person has some training in the actual treatment for hoarding, but if they don't, your next best thing is find someone who's a CBT therapist who is willing to follow the protocol with you. Um, and the treatment workbook you know, is in the, the list of books that I mentioned. So a good CBT therapist who maybe doesn't know hoarding, but maybe there isn't one around, but who's willing to walk through the protocol with you is a good second option. And the reason for that is the skills that are used in the treatment are very similar types of skills that CBT therapists would use for other conditions. It's just applying those skills to hoarding specifically. Um, so if you are able to find a good CBT therapist who's willing to walk through the protocol with you, that's another good idea. A, sec a third idea would be um, looking for actually professional organizers which sometimes there are actually more professional organizers in a particular area than there might be mental health specialists. And then looking for those um, organizers who actually have some experience working with hoarding. Um, and those folks are out there for sure. Uh, but they can be a good place to start if you can't access a mental health professional um, directly first. So those are kind of a number of different avenues that people can look for for help. There was a follow-up to an earlier question about which part of the brain was active in people having difficulty mm, deciding a great question. a shred of mail. Yeah, that's a great question. It's been a couple of years since I've uh, read through that study. If I'm remembering correctly, nope, I'm not even going to say because I'm not going to remember correctly, <laughs> but they're the parts of the brain that have to do with emotion um, and I think also decision-making. I think there's just really one more other comments in the chat or commenting on other things in the chat, but not necessarily questions. Okay. But so the last one, because um, I want to be respectful of your time, we have about three minutes left. Um, they say that they're a public housing inspector in Portland metro area, and they run into a lot of hoarding situations. And her, mm -hmm. their greatest concern is making sure that the homes are safe. Do you mm -hmm. have any literature or pamphlets that they might be able to share with their clients? Oh, that's a great question. Or other possible um, resources in the area of Portland, Oregon? Is Portland, Oregon. Um, I, you know what I would, honestly, I would do is reach out to the King County Hoarding Task Force up here in Seattle because they have been meeting probably for a decade. I mean, they may be one of the kind of longer running similar such task force forces. And I would be shocked if they did not have either those materials or sort of be able to point to those materials because I know that they interface with a lot of agencies here in King County um, and run into those um, run into those types of situations all the time. So I think that'd be the first place I'd start. Um, I think of any other ideas. I think that'd be the first place I'd start is cities that are have been developing these task forces and doing this work like in a kind of team based approach for a while that have probably developed materials that they can give to folks is what I'd start with. King County is certainly not the only county. Um, I know there are a number of counties around the country that have had hoarding task forces for a while, but I'm, I'm just most aware of, of, of King County's. There was someone that had commented that that they have a um, hoarding connection in I think it's Cuyahoga. Colorado and they partner okay. with APS, police, housing, Great. and mental health Great. agencies. Great. Another resource would be um, a psychologist named Jennifer Sampson. Um, she practices, I think, near Tacoma. Um, she's a hoarding specialist, among other things, but she actually started the King County Hoarding Task Force and has been involved in hoarding research and treatment for most of her career. Um, but I think has done more work than probably most psychologists with these kind of different systems, these interdisciplinary systems. And so you might reach out to her to see if she also has resources that are maybe separate from what the task force might have. 
that wraps it up. Lots of thank yous um, for a great presentation. Yeah. You're welcome. Which I would well, agree. That was very informational. I enjoyed it immensely. Great. So well, I appreciate I your time. Thank you. I appreciate everyone for showing up this evening. I will definitely send along the slides so people can have access to those as well as the resources at the end. That would be fantastic. And once I get them to everybody that's on the call, I will send that out as well as a link to any future programs we might have. Great. Yep. All the thank yous are flying in. And somebody did post the hoardingconnection.org in its uh, Cuyahoga County. Okay. Great. Some resources there. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Osborne. I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Take care. You too. Bye. Bye. I will drop my um, email in the chat. Um, and send everybody that attended today a copy of the slides as soon as I receive them. So thank you all for attending. This um, has been recorded. Once it is uploaded and trimmed, we'll try to get it on our website as soon as possible. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>